Good morning. I'm Reverend Mike Capron with another in our series on the great ends of the church. This morning is preservation of the truth. And uh, we're going to read a, the famous dialogue between Governor Pontius Pilate of Judea and his prisoner who's been arrested, um, Jesus of Nazareth, um, who would later be known as the Christ. <laughs> um, so John 18, 33 through 19, 12. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you've done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus asked, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into this world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth answers to me. What is truth? retorted Pilate. And with this, he went out again to the Jews gathered there and said, I find no basis for a charge against him, but it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of Passover. Do you want me to release, quote, the king of the Jews? They shouted back, no, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now, Barabbas had taken part in an uprising. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers also twisted together a crown of thorns and placed it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they slapped him in the face. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here's the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, We have a law, and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? he asked Jesus, but Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jewish leaders kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. This ends our reading. What is truth? Of all the unanswered questions in Scripture, this is the one I wish Jesus had answered. What is truth? It hangs there in the air. Pilate asked it and then walked away. The truth is, he didn't care about the answer. If he did, he wouldn't have walked away from Jesus. What is truth? We live in a day and a time where the very question has an odd, rather quaint sound to it. We all know this, although chances are you've never talked about it explicitly. How you know it depends on your age. If you are over, say, 45, 50, then you probably look around culture and society today and see all the changes and get an uneasy feeling. We live in a multicultural, multi-ethnic, globalized, inclusive, postmodern world these days. But there was a time when everyone around you and everyone you saw in the news and everyone on television sitcoms looked more or less the same and acted more or less the same and most importantly, believed more or less the same. And that was very comforting. In such a setting, what is truth was an easy question. The answer was, what everyone believes. If, on the other hand, you are under 45, it's entirely possible that the very question, what is truth, sounds peculiar to you. 
It may make you downright uncomfortable or suspicious. Your thinking may go like this. When you ask what truth is, you are implying that there is just one truth. But when I look around, I see many truths. I see Buddhists and Muslims and Jews and Christians and Hindus and atheists and New Agers and everyone. I see different cultures and different traditions and tons of different opinions. Wouldn't it be arrogant and exclusive to claim to know the truth? If you put all those different views in a pot and cook them for a while, one idea is likely to emerge. Either there is no absolute truth or that truth is not important. People enthralled by this notion live their moment, their life moment by moment, blown this way and that by the winds of chance and whatever seems to be appealing today. And so we have two answers to the question, what is true? Either what everyone thinks or there is no truth. And both answers are equally wrong. Any claim about truth that has its root in human opinion, either from a whole bunch of people who think alike or from a bunch of multi-everything people who think very differently, is doomed to failure. Genuine, reliable, foundational truth must have its root in what we call revelation. Revelation means that God reveals the truth to us, reveals to us the way of things, how the world works. And this happens in two ways. One is well, sometimes called general revelation. That refers to things we can learn from nature. For most of us, this happens in an informal way as we garden or watch the birds or enjoy the turn of the seasons. But general revelation also includes scientific knowledge like the theory of gravity, understandings of human anatomy, and hard sciences like geology. And since it and it also includes some understanding of God, as Romans one twenty says, ever since the creation of the world, God's eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through the things that He has made. And so people are without excuse. We know this. Who among us has not had some sense of God while gazing at the beauty of the world? But even general revelation is not enough for us to really know the truth. What we also need is called special revelation. Special revelation is God communicating directly to human beings. This happens primarily through the Holy Spirit, speaking to people across the centuries. Abraham, Moses, Samuel, Elijah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, John, Peter, Paul, and so many others. And they wrote down what they saw and heard. And what they wrote down is a testimony about God in the Bible. So the Bible itself is special revelation, a privileged information source that tells us about God's interaction with God's people. But I have not spoken of the clearest, most profound, and most important source of special revelation, Jesus Christ himself. Even Jesus said so. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. John 14, 67. But I digress. We ought to be talking about John chapter 18 and Pilate's question about truth. Why was Jesus talking to Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor? On the night he was betrayed, the temple leaders had brought him there to convince Pilate to have Jesus executed in a horrible way. The Jews were really worried about blasphemy, for Jesus claimed to be God's son and Messiah. But they told Pilate to charge with sedition that Jesus had claimed to be a king. So Pilate came right and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus replied, Is that your own idea? Or did others talk to you about talk to you about me? Good point, Jesus. To be in the truth, one must know and love the truth personally. It does no good at all for one's grandmother or father to have known and loved the truth. We must know it for ourselves. All the revelation in the world, no matter how special, does us no good if we do not accept it and act on it. Pilate's next question, what have you done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is of another place. Here we come to the crux of the matter. The truth is not obvious to this world. It belongs to another place 
and only those whose hearts are in another place can perceive it. After all, here was Jesus of Nazareth, the carpenter's son, an uneducated itinerant preacher, beaten and in chains, talking back to the Roman governor who is to decide if he will be executed or not. And here we are gathered here some 2,000 years later because we claim this same Jesus did not stay dead but rose again, that he truly was God's son and Messiah. What kind of lunacy is that? Wonderful lunacy. Better yet, it's true. What is truth? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. That's the famous Apostles' Creed, if you didn't recognize them. And crazy as it sounds, that's the truth, the absolute honest-to-God truth. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1.18, the message about the cross, it's foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those of us who are being saved, it is the very power of God. Pilate listened to Jesus' words and exclaimed, perhaps sarcastically, Oh, you are a king then. Jesus answered, You are right in saying that I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. You see, we are not having an esoteric discussion on the nature of truth and knowledge. What is truth? It is a side that one takes, a decision about how to live. Everyone on the side of the truth listens to Jesus. Everyone on the side of truth does not listen to what other people think, neither when everyone thinks much the same thing, nor when they seem to all think something different. Everyone on the side of the truth listens to Jesus, because truth is not found in human opinion, but in divine revelation. And perhaps that itself is the most fundamental truth we must preserve as we speak about this great end of the truth, the preservation great end of the church, the preservation of the truth. That is our heritage as Protestants in the Reformed tradition. We remember the way Martin Luther looked at the church of his day and defied human opinion about it. He pointed to God's word, God's revelation, and stood his ground. We remember the way that Geneva, Switzerland, asked John Calvin to come and show them how to live in a godly way, to live into the truth. This is our heritage as Protestants. We look at society and culture and even the church itself, and we measure it against the truth. And we protest that which does not measure up. It doesn't matter if it was corruption in the 16th century or the slavery of the 19th century or the racial discrimination of the 20th century or the polarized ideologies of both left and right in the 21st century. We know we can't roll back the clock to any earlier time but we can shape the future. We can hold fast to the truth, who, by the way, is a person. And we can speak the truth in love for the benefit of those who desperately need to hear it. And that is truly an important end or goal for the church. Amen. God bless.